So thank you for coming to my talk, everybody. Um, I'm Paul Dix, I'm the creator of InfluxDB, and I'm the founder of Influx Data, which is the company behind it. Uh, and in this talk, I wanted to talk about work that we're doing to integrate stuff from the Prometheus ecosystem with Influx uh, and have the two work together. Um, so I'm sure everybody already knows Prometheus. Uh, just in case you don't know Influx, uh, it is an open source time series database. Uh, it is MIT licensed. It's written in Go. It has a query language right now that looks kind of like SQL. I'll show an example of that in a second. Um, a few years ago, we decided to write our own storage engine uh, from scratch, uh, which is a difficult undertaking. Uh, and we call it the time series merge tree. Um, it's basically like an LSM tree, but specifically designed for our use case. And actually, the database is kind of like two databases in one. One part of the database is an inverted index that matches metadata that describe time series with the underlying time series itself. And then the other is the actual compressed time series storage, which uh, on disk, it looks very much like a columnar store. And we, have, we use different types of compression depending on the shape of the data. Uh, and then finally, we have a commercial offering, which is uh, our high availability or scale out clustering stuff. So the data model of Influx looks like this. You have a measurement name, which is a string. You have tags, which are key value pairs where the values are strings. And this is all indexed data. And then you have a set of fields. So with Prometheus, measurement is basically like metric and tags are basically the same. The one thing that we have different that Prometheus doesn't have is you can have multiple fields uh, with an individual data point. And then the other key difference is our Timestamps are in nanoseconds, whereas Prometheus, they're in milliseconds. Um, I was actually pretty surprised the first time I heard of people using nanosecond stuff, but we do have people who use the nanosecond precision uh, timestamps. So basically, like people in like high frequency trading where they have atomic clocks that guarantee there are less than 300 nanoseconds worth of clock drift globally, they actually track the performance of their network hardware uh, at that level. So one thing that's a little bit different about Influx from other time series databases is we actually support multiple data types. It's not just floats. So float 64, int 64, UN 64, booleans, and strings. So strings open up uh, some interesting use cases around basically keeping log data inside Influx, which is indexed using the same metadata as your time series data. So I mentioned we have a query language that looks kind of like SQL. That's this. We're grabbing the 90th percentile from the CPU measurement for the last 12 hours of time uh, from the Western region. And we're grouping that in 10-minute buckets uh, and getting a separate series for each individual host. Um, so the, the first thing we did to do integration with Prometheus was uh, basically adding support for Prometheus, Prometheus's remote read and write API. So Prometheus has a thing where it can actually replicate its data that it's scraping into remote targets. And it can also query that data out of remote targets as well. So one question I got asked is like, why would we do this? It seems like Prometheus and Influx are competing projects. So why would we try to integrate them? I think there's, there, there is some room for them to play well together. And there are certain cases where it might make sense to run both. So the first, obviously, is long-term storage of data. We're built, like our goal is to be a database, whereas I think of Prometheus more as a monitoring system. Um, so if you want a guaranteed long-term data store, you can replicate all your Prometheus data out. Another nice thing is if you're replicating it out, you can have basically queries that span data that is collected from multiple Prometheus servers, right? So you can basically effectively get federated queries, but out of a single source. And the other nice thing is that obviously we support push as well. So you, you can do push as well as pull based data. And for some things like push is actually really nice, right? For things that are more, more like events as opposed to samples that are collected at uh, fixed intervals of time. So the other nice thing is you can have this concept of like ephemeral Prometheus, right? Uh, as anybody 
who is running Kubernetes in production is painfully aware, state in Kubernetes sucks. <laughs> it's much, much better if you don't have to deal with state. So if you can just deploy your Prometheus servers, have like each application team run their own Prometheus server, but have a central place where they can all write their data up into, right? So then you can run those as basically stateless applications and you can just have the operator make sure that one's always running. Uh, so let's get into the remote read write API. Uh, so basically to turn that on, first you have to go into your Prometheus config and tell it where to go. So this is the endpoint. Here I'm just pointing at my local host because I was doing development there. So that this is an endpoint inside InfluxDB. And that tells Prometheus to write the data there. And also when you do a query, it will pull data from there as well and combine it with the Prometheus, the data that Prometheus actually has. So for us, the writes are kind of easy to think about, right? How do we translate the the Prometheus data model into the influx data model, well, we could just say the measurement name is the metric and that field is just something we'll call value, right? So we won't, everything will just always have one field. Um, but the tricky part is there, there are things that you can do in the Prometheus queries, right? So here's an example Prometheus query where we have uh, a couple of different matchers. And we have a regex matcher, and then we have a not equals matcher. So for, for influx, the current query language for influx QL, the not equals matchers are actually problematic. We don't actually support that against the measurement name. So here's what that looks like in the Prometheus code. They basically have like a protobuf object that specifies what a query is. You have the start timestamp, you have the end timestamp, and you have a set of matchers. And the matchers are always combined basically using a logical and. Um, our problem was we had to figure out how to support these two use cases, um, which we couldn't do with the influx query language uh, out of the box. But we can do it against tags. So essentially, when I originally wrote this feature, this was back in September, um, I just did this kind of like ghetto hack, right? So I basically made the measurement name and the field name kind of no ops. And I just shoehorned all the data into tags, right? Which is actually, when you look at what Prometheus does under the hood, that's also what they do. Like a metric name is actually just a special tag called underscore, underscore, name, underscore, underscore, right? Under the covers, they, they work with it like it's a tag. So essentially, like that's how I wrote the data. That's how I structured the schema to make this work. Um, and my thinking at the time was that this would be future-proof work that would work well with what I had planned for 2.0 version of Influx, right? The the new query language that we're developing and the and the the new stuff that we're building there. Uh, but the problem is like. It's great if you're just using Prometheus to query the data out of that influx server, but if you want to query the influx server directly, having that schema kind of sucks because you end up not you end up not using the measurement name at all, not using a field, and that's good like descriptive stuff that you want to use to describe your data. So, let me talk really quickly about the work that we've been doing on 2.0 that has enabled uh, us to make uh, something slightly better than what I had done in September. So the first big thing that we're doing is we're creating a new query language, uh, which is great, another query language. <laughs> um, I have a whole talk about this one. That's a separate thing. But uh, I, I believe that uh, when working with time series data, SQL is an abstraction that is kind of clunky, right? Time series isn't really sets, so I think the, the abstraction that works really, really well is a functional style, very much like Graphite. I think that's one thing that Graphite did really well. Um, so the new query language that we're designing is a new functional language. But in addition to a new language, we're also at the same time creating a new execution engine. And one of the goals on this work is we want to decouple storage from compute. Right? Compute is like the query processing workloads, right? And the, the reason we want to do that is because we want to be able to iterate on the language quickly without putting the data at risk, right? Because there's, it's, it's a very high cost to update your data plane. It's less cost to update an application tier that's basically stateless, right? So we can iterate and deploy on these query processors and have a much like higher 
like much more frequent releases there that don't put the storage tier at risk. And then the other nice thing is you can scale those independently. So this is very similar to how Amazon Athena works. So Athena is basically the Presto SQL engine on top of S3. And you pay for storage, which is S3, and you pay for compute, which is just the query processing. The other nice property you get out of this is you can trivially create workload isolation. Right? If, it's a sh if the query processor is a shared nothing system, you can spin it up in a new container. You can set resource limits on it. Right? Uh, it's, it's nice because if, if you're trying to design a multi-tenanted system, one, you get that workload isolation. But even if you don't have a multi-tenanted system, what I frequently see is data scientists will have a separate production cluster than the actual prod. And the reason they do that is because their, their query workloads are kind of crazy and they want to isolate that. But it sucks to have to replicate an entire product, production infrastructure just to isolate the data science query workloads. So our goal here is that we don't have to duplicate the storage piece, but we can still spin up new stuff on the fly for the data scientists to work and not you know, hit prod and bring it down or anything like that. So as part of the work for IFQL and this new execution engine, one thing we had to do was we had to basically create a new like lower level like query tier that works with the database. So essentially we have a new like protocol that we have. It's basically just TCP um, and protobufs right now. We're actually going to be switching it to use Apache Arrow as the data interchange format, but it's much more primitive than uh, InfluxQL. Basically, it's, it looks more like those Prometheus matchers, right? You have a start time, you have an end time, it can pull back the data, and then it can send it to the query processor. We also have stuff where we're going to be pushing down processing as well. So essentially, we can do, you know, if you're doing, you know, if you're doing like min or max in certain buckets of time, you can compute those locally on the node and then have the query processor node basically just combine the results. Um, so... With that work that went in, that work is in the 1.5 release of InfluxDB, which we cut uh, about a month ago. Um, but with that work, I was able to update the Prometheus stuff so that instead of using the InfluxQL query engine, I could just bypass it. And I, this, this new storage query tier like, works in a way where I can actually now just have the measurement name be the metric name so that I can go to my database and I can say, this is the influx uh, command line interface. And I can do, oh, show my measurements. And I can see, obviously, this is a bunch of stuff from, from Prometheus. Uh, so this work isn't yet in a build. I have it on a branch right now on the, on the InfluxDB repo. It's there. If you would like to play around with it, you can build it there. There's also an issue where I'm tracking it, so I'm looking for feedback uh, from people who use it uh, to see how it works. Um, so one of the other big things that we're doing with, uh, with our efforts around 2.0 of Influx is we're also trying to decouple the idea of the query language from the compute, like the compute tier, from the processing engine. So essentially what we're doing is we have a parser that will parse the language into a DAG. So every single query in Influx can be represented as a direct acyclic graph, right? And the idea there is that we'll be able to have any number of query languages on top of this execution engine. Right? So obviously, on the new execution engine, we have to build support for InfluxQL. Right? For better or worse, we have to continue to support that because a lot of people do love it, even though I think the functional style is better. <laughs> uh, we also want to build support for TickScript, which is the language that we designed for Capacitor, which is like query processing and stuff like that. But the idea is that IFQL is going to be the one language that unifies the platform as a whole, whether you're doing interactive batch queries or you're doing background processing or ETL tasks or monitoring and alerting. And then ideally, what we'd like to do later this year is we'd like to add a PromQL layer on top of it. So you could actually just issue PromQL queries to an Influx server and it'll know what to do. And who knows, maybe other, other query languages will pop up as well. The, the thing about... Query language design, uh, language design in general, the thing uh, that I realized is it's, it's really like an aesthetic thing. 
you can get a group of engineers, reasonable people, to disagree about what's good in language design. And they could all be right at the same time. <laughs> but it's a matter of aesthetics and what you prefer to work with. So in my ideal world, we can have languages that some people like working with that feel more like expert languages or whatever, and other languages that are easier for beginner use cases and stuff like that. Um, we want to support as broad of a community as possible. And ultimately, what we want to do around Influx and the projects that we're building is we want to support the Prometheus ecosystem as a whole, right? Because there's a whole lot of good work that's going into, you know, it's not just the Prometheus server itself. They're all the exporters, right, for exposing metrics and, and all that kind of stuff. There, there are the, the client libraries that you use to instrument your applications. And I think that's all good work, and we would like to be able to have our tools work seamlessly and really well with those tools as well. So we already support scraping. Uh, so Telegraph is our collection agent. Uh, it can scrape Prometheus targets. Uh, Capacitor, which is our processing agent, can also scrape Prometheus targets. Um, in my mind, in the 2.0 version of the product, we are going to have all of that kind of built in out of the box. Um, the other thing I'd like to see move forward is the efforts around open metrics. So basically, this is creating a standard uh, that people can agree on for basically defining metrics. Um, I'm not sure how far along that work is or if people can agree on it, but <laughs> I would like to see that actually get to some level of completion where people can say, okay, this is good enough for a V1 of this standard, and then we can kind of form around that. So I'd like to close the talk with uh, some future work that we're thinking about, and I'm curious to get feedback from people in the audience about which of these pieces seem interesting or worth pursuing, right? So one thing I mentioned is we want to decouple the query processing from the storage tier, and what will kind of naturally rise from that is, in theory, we could build connectors to Prometheus servers. So you could actually use the IFQL query processing tier to query any number of Prometheus servers and Influx servers and actually combine those results. And potentially, you could use IFQL to query Prometheus, which you may or may not want to do. I guess it depends on how much you love PromQL. <laughs> um, but the idea with this new, this new engine and this new language is the thing that we want to achieve is we want to do the same thing for the query engine that we did for Telegraph. So Telegraph is a data collector. What we did was we defined a clear, like, there are input plugins, there are output plugins. And what, what we had from a code perspective is we wanted to design it so that new contributors could write input plugins without having to understand the entirety of the Telegraph code base. And this is the same thing that I'd love to see in the query engine itself, which is new contributors can come in, and they don't have to understand the, the entirety of the database and all these different complex people uh, pieces. They would be able to define input plugins, right? So input plugins could be an Influx server. It could be S3. It could be a SQL server. It could be Prometheus. It could be a third-party service. Anything you can think of. There are sets of functions, which are essentially transformations on the data. Um, and ideally, people would be able to add new functions really, really easily. Um, and then finally, there are output plugins. So this is for background processing tasks, essentially. But the idea there is, an out, like the, obviously, the initial output plugin we have is pipe the data back into Influx, right? So you could use it for monitoring and alerting. You could use it for downsampling your data. But you could just as easily say, have a Kafka output plugin or an S3 output plugin. So you do a query, and instead of writing data back to Influx or returning a result to the user, in the background, it can write that result to some other service. Uh, one other thing that I think is potentially interesting is I don't, I don't think the Prometheus Remote Read Write API is very efficient. I think it was basically like a ghetto hack that was done quickly. <laughs> uh, and it's just kind of grown from there. Uh, what I think might be interesting work is maybe using Apache Arrow as the data interchange format. So Apache Arrow is basically, it's a standard for defining essentially columnar data in memory, like a memory format. Um, 
Uh, Wes McKinney, the guy who created Pandas, is doing this to try and standardize what data tools data scientists use so that they can pass data around without making copies of it, right? Because in data science, like it's common, like you have to query it out of the database, you marshal it into one format, then you do some reformatting on it, and then you can process it and whatever. What he's trying to do with this is make it so that there's a data interchange format so you don't have to marshal it and unmarshal it and reprocess it and whatever. So the idea is whether you're working in Spark or Pandas or any of these other things, you can pass data around without having to do all this expensive copying. So I think it would be interesting uh, from uh, a Prometheus in Influx perspective is adding Apache Arrow as basically a data interchange format instead of what it uses right now, which is it's protobufs over HTTP, right? Um, and so we've already started on the work on the Arrow stuff. Uh, we actually, there wasn't an official Go implementation of Apache Arrow. Uh, so we started work on it, and Wes had noticed uh, what we were doing, uh, and we officially contributed it back to the ASF as like the official Go implementation. Uh, it's still not done. There's still a lot of work to be done on it, but we're going to continue to push that forward, and I would like to see that potentially used to trade data bet between uh, Prometheus and Influx. So uh, that is all I have. I have plenty of time for questions, if people have any. <laughs> All right. <laughs> what? Yes. Yeah, so, so the... Yeah, so the, the question was, it looks like for the remote write interface, Prometheus doesn't include what the type of metric is. Is it a histogram? Is it a gauge, right? Is it a counter? Um, uh, we don't need that. I don't think Prometheus actually uses that under the hood. Like, it's defined as metadata, but I think it's kind of like no-op at this point. Uh, I don't know, if one of the Prometheus developers is in the room, they may need to correct me, but I, if I recall, I don't think they actually use that right now. So, but that's probably something where if they did start using it in the future, we would need to have that data. So, and that's what I'm saying is I think, I, I think the, there could be a lot more work done on like the standard around the remote read and remote write stuff. I think what was done was just you know, the fastest thing that would work, and it has so far, basically. But there's no, like, I, I think that API is still, like, flagged as experimental, so there's no guarantee that it's going to continue to remain the same. Back there? Uh, the question is, do we do anything in our query engine around cost accounting, basically, like, costing out the query? Not yet. Uh, that is something that we will be doing later this year, but that's also one of those things where it's, it's a multi-year effort. It's, it's decades of work. <laughs> so, so, yeah, right now we just do this simple stupid thing, but we will be doing stuff like that uh, hopefully in the future. And we are actively hiring for the query processing roles. <laughs> So the question is, if we're looking at switching to Influx, is, a good, is it a good idea to wait for the IQL engine to mature before making the switch? Um, again, like, I, don't, I don't think running Influx or running Prometheus is like an either or proposition. Uh, I think it's totally possible to run both. You could literally have Prometheus running as essentially your data collector, and you can use both and query both, right? And Grafana works really, really well with both, obviously. So I think... I honestly, like, I think the lowest risk way to do it is to not, like, uh, 
a pull and replace is always like the riskiest way to deploy new software, right? Like the best way is to run the new thing in parallel, get used to how it works, get used to how it operates and familiarize the team with it and, and actually make a decision from there. Um, I think the, the IFQL stuff, so we're, Nathaniel, the key developer that's writing it, is actually writing the formal spec this week. So we should have that available. So the whole language itself is going to be fully spec'd out. We should have that available within the next week or two. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of work that's happening there. Right now, uh, IFQL is not like something that we're saying is production ready. It's basically like this is test code to get feedback from the community. Right now, our recommendation for actual production workloads is to continue to use InfluxQL, the, the SQL style language. Cool. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you very much, everybody.